Disney, MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. Welcome to A Conversation with George Burns. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. George Burns. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, look, if I can stand, you can stand. <laughs> look, let me tell you something. I played Orlando in, in 1927. They must have liked me, because here it is 62 years later, and I'm back again. <laughs> well, I am. People are always saying to me, George, when are you going to retire? Retire. Who'd support my mother and father? Okay, I'm here to answer the questions. You ask the questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, when did you start acting? I started in show business when I was eight years old. With three other kids, we called ourselves the Pee Wee Quartet. We used to make syrup in a candy store down in the, in the, in the basement. You put in chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. And there was a, a letter carrier on, on the Lower East Side. He, 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 he taught everybody harmony. And he saw four kids and he taught us how to sing. So we gave up making chocolate and we went into show business. Went on ferry boats and street yards and we sang, we passed around our hats. Sometimes they throw something into the hats and sometimes they take our hats. <laughs> we lost a lot of hats. George, do you remember any of the songs you used to do? Sure. Uh, the, any song that would have harmony. We sang, the songs made no sense, like Mary Ann, Mary Ann, Mary sat in the corner. Night and day, night and day, she was lazy, we thought she was crazy. Well, I don't know, I don't know, what's the matter with Mary? Some say the Bowery is not very flowery. When Johnny comes marching, Johnny get a gun, get a gun, get a gun, and beat McNulty too. Where did you get that hat? What hat? The old red, white, and blue. Razzle, dazzle, razzle, dazzle, city of the young for. And the only song I like to sing is, You're a grand old flag. <laughs> Anyway, from 8 to 27, I did all kinds of acts. I worked with the seal, I worked with the dog, I worked with anybody or anyone who would work with me. But I, I wasn't doing well, but I thought I was doing well, because I loved what I was doing. And I still love it. And I was doing a skating act, dancing on skates, uh, 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 shuffle dancing and buck dancing. And when you dance on skates, the back wheels don't turn, they're frozen. You just skate out on your front wheels and you get down your dance. Anyway, it was a lousy act. And I was, I was sitting in Farley Marcus's office, which is a small time agent, and he booked one-nighters. And I heard Farley Marcus say to the secretary, uh, we could use a dog act around Conkoma. So I said to the secretary, tell Farley Marcus that Brown and Williams and their dogs are sitting outside. Got me the job. We picked up two dogs, we held them, we skated around, and they came back. <laughs> Mr. Burns, after 93 years, what was your most embarrassing moment? When I was a young fellow, I played the Savoy Theatre. And I walked out on the stage and I did a singing act. And my fly was open. <laughs> but that wasn't embarrassing. The next show, I closed my fly and the manager canceled me. <laughs> that was embarrassing. <laughs> Burns, in your long and memorable career, what... Would you consider to be the greatest highlights? Of well, the, the highlights of my life was when Gracie married me. And, um, well, Gracie didn't, uh, Gracie, um, uh, Gracie lived with two girls, with Rena Arnold and uh, Mary Kelly. They were three Catholic girls. 
And Gracie was going around with a songwriter. His name was Benny Ryan. And Gracie was in love with Benny Ryan. She was going to marry Benny Ryan. And I figured that, and I was working with Gracie then. So I figured I'd write a song too. So I wrote a song, this is the song I wrote. I love you, love you, love you, I do. You're the only girl that I adore. I love you, love you, love you, I do. And every day I love you more and more. Someday I may build a little home for two. We'll settle down for life and you, if you'll be my wife because I love you, I love you, I do. And Gracie said, if you write one more song like that, I'll marry Benny Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, take my Uncle Harvey. Look at the job he lost helping that plumber just because he did what the plumber told him to. That's why I lost the job? Yeah, well, what happened was they were both trying to hammer some pipe through an, a hole in the wall, and um, so the plumber held it, and uh, he said to Uncle Harvey, now when I nod my head, you hit it with a big hammer. <laughs> Plumber did, and Uncle Harvey did. And Uncle Harvey isn't working for the plumber anymore. Well, isn't any plumber anymore. <laughs> Pretty hard for Uncle Harvey to hold a job, isn't it? Yes, best job he ever had. He only held one day. He got a job taking care of the lighthouse. And only held it one day? Mm-hmm. Well, you see, the first night he was there, it, it was very, very foggy, so he figured nobody could see the light anyway, so he turned it out and went to sleep. <laughs> You, Thank you. I love you, too. What are you doing later? <laughs> I'd like to know that when you first met Gracie, was it love at first sight or did she grow on you? I worked with Gracie for, oh, about two years before, before we got married. How we got married was this. It was uh, Christmas, around Christmas time, and we were booked in Detroit and Cleveland. Cleveland and Detroit. And Gracie was still going around with with uh, B uh, Benny Ryan. But the girl that lived with Gracie, Mary Kelly, liked me better than she liked Benny Ryan. And Mary Kelly told Gracie I was a nice, uh, make, make a better husband. Anyway, that night, Christmas night or something, I said to Gracie, and Benny Ryan was there, I said, Gracie, this can't go on. When we, after we played Detroit, Cleveland and Detroit, let's call it off and you can get married to Benny Ryan. And I was very sad. And I went home because not only I was in love with Gracie, but I was in love with my with show business, you know. The first time I ever did, uh, did well. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, Gracie called me up. She says, you can get the marriage license. We'll get married in Cleveland. So in Cleveland, we got married. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we got there at 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, a room for two people was $7 then, double room. So if, we got, if you checked in at 5 o'clock in the morning, you'd have to pay $7. So we sat in the lobby for two hours and, uh, <laughs> and we saved seven dollars the day we got married. Anyway, it's a great marriage. If you need me, I'll be in the den. I'll need you. Gracie, <laughs> I don't know what's on your mind, but we were married in Cleveland and Jack Benny was there as a witness, remember? And Victor Moore was supposed to be the judge. Victor Moore didn't marry us. Why didn't you tell me then? I could have spent our honeymoon looking for a husband. <laughs> Will you start this from the beginning? Where's our marriage license? I want to see it. Don't you remember, Gracie? Our marriage license was in a trunk, and the trunk was burnt in Vancouver. But I'll be glad to get your duplicate. You want a trunk? That won't prove we're married. <laughs> I'm looking for Gracie. That's right. Call me Gracie. Everybody calls me Gracie. <laughs> What's wrong with that? If we were really married, they'd call me Mrs. Burns. <laughs> Already? Already. <laughs> Harry, when you talk to her, I'm going out to get a little air. Oh, I should have known why we've been billed as George Burns and Gracie Allen. Everybody knew we weren't married but me. The wife is always the last one to find out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I like you, Harry. No matter how much trouble other people have, you can always laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me tell you something. Gracie was a very religious Catholic girl. I'm Jewish. And I'm not too religious. So Gracie's 
went to church, ate first Friday, and all my children are all Catholics, my great-grandchildren. I'm the only Jew in my family. <laughs> I'm the only one that eats Friday night with my hat on. I know you like martinis and cigars. How is your health? I smoke between them. Um, between 10 and 20 or between 15 and 20 cigars a day. Well, you see, at my age, if I don't hold on to something, I might fall down. <laughs> I drink between four and five martinis a day. Well, I know you do that. And the doctor that told me to stop is dead. <laughs> An inspiration still being vivacious as you are is do you have a secret in a, an exercise or diet program that you're using well right now? I, yeah i do i do i'll tell you what my day consists of i get up in the morning and um and i scrub my teeth and i do exercise i do the canadian air force exercise i've been doing it for years and years and years it takes about 30 35 minutes i do a lot of strenuous exercise i do sit-ups throw my head and back of my my feet in the back of my head and put my hands under my high knee and do bicycle riding upside down and do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and then I have breakfast and I take a little walk in the garden for about 10 minutes. Then I go to the office. I got an office and I got writers. Sit and there's always something to do in the office. This is what I'm not, when I'm not working, I do this. And then I go to the club. I belong to a country club. I have lunch with a lot of fellas and I sit down and I play bridge. And I play with guys that are older than I am. Like I was playing with one guy and he had a battery in his ear, you know, a hearing aid. And I said to him, your battery's not working. He says, he says thanks, George, you look good too. <laughs> I love bridge. I play bridge until about a quarter of three. And at three o'clock I'm home. About 3.30 I go to bed. Take a little nap. I get up around five o'clock and I have a double martini. <laughs> There's somebody with me. I get out of bed very quietly. I don't want to wake her up. Look, I lie a lot. <laughs> Georgie Jesser was a good friend of mine, and he used to sit for hours telling me stories about you, about the one where you sent him roses week after week and never told him who they came from, or would cross the street when he'd come up and talk to you. Could you tell us more stories about that? Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, Jessel was very funny. Georgie Jessel. About 40 years ago, I was still playing golf. I was sitting at the club, and Georgie Jessel was at the bar having his third brandy at nine o'clock in the morning. So I walked over to him, I said, Georgie, is that your third brandy at nine o'clock in the morning? He says, yeah. I says, I says, three brandies? He says, well, George, haven't you heard? He says, no. He says, Norma Talmadge left me. I said, but Norma Talmadge left you 35 years ago. He says, I still miss her. <laughs> then another thing he did, uh, funny. He, Norma Talmadge was married to Jessel. And she eloped with the doctor and left Jessel. And Jessel flew to Florida and with a gun to shoot the doctor. He took a shot at the doctor, he missed the doctor, but he hit a gardener two blocks away. <laughs> and the gardener took him to court. And the judge said to Jessel, how can you aim at the doctor and hit a gardener two blocks away? He says, Your Honor, I'm Georgie Jessel an actor, I'm not Buffalo Bill. <laughs> he was funny. And what type of formal education did you receive growing up? I had very little schooling. I, uh, I, I only went to the fourth grade. My schooling was show business. I was with the, I came from a very, very poor family. We were uh, 12 in the family. Seven sisters and five brothers. And no food. I think we ate one of my sisters. <laughs> I also think we used ketchup. <laughs> You've lived a long life, and you mentioned you had a very large uh, family, brothers and sisters. Yes. How many of them are living now? None of them. I'm the only one in my family alive. Hi. I must tell you one story about my sister, though. My sister, um, Mamie, she, she lived quite long, and she was 93, too. And I called her up once. I says, Mamie, how do you feel? She says, I'm 93 and hung up. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ask anybody 93 how you feel. George, you've been in radio, television, movies, vaudeville. Which is the most rewarding to you? 
Well, I, the thing that I like best is making movies. Because if you don't do it good, you can do it over. You can do it over 10 times. When I walk out on the stage, I stand there when I play Vegas, I say, I'm on the stage for about an hour. And if it's no good, you can't do it again. So in pictures, you, and I like acting because you can sit down and act. And I'm at the stage now where I do everything better sitting down. <laughs> Mr. Burns, out of all of the movies that you have made, which is your favorite? Well, I've made a lot of movies with Gracie, though, I love. But I, I, I love The Sunshine Boys. I won an Academy Award with The Sunshine Boys, so I love that. Knock, knock, knock. Enter! What do you mean, enter? What happened to come in? It's the same thing, isn't it? Enter or come in, what's the difference as long as you're in? The difference is we've done this sketch 11,000 times. And you always said, come in. Suddenly, today, it's enter. Why today, after all these years, do you suddenly change it to enter? I'm trying to freshen up the act. Who asked you to freshen up the act? <laughs> I'll tell you one story about Walter Matthau. We were making The Sunshine Boys, which was a great thing for me, because it was the first time I ever played a character. And Jack Benny was supposed to do The Sunshine Boys with Matthau, but he passed away, so... My manager, Irving Fine, was Jack Manny, uh, Jack Manny's manager, and I would, they took me, I read for the part, and they gave it to me. Anyway, in the Sunshine Boys, there was a sketch uh, where uh, Walter Matthau and myself did sort of a Smithsonian sketch. And the, the props were funny, and the dialogue was funny. So I said to Walter, I said, Walter, I don't think the sketch is going to play because the audience won't know whether to watch the props or listen to the dialogue. He said, boy, he said, that makes sense to me. Why don't you tell it to Neil Simon? And Neil Simon is the world's greatest writer. I would tell him he'd fire me. I said, I got nothing to tell you. And Neil Simon passed, and I called him over, so Walter has something to tell you. <laughs> so Walter told him, Neil Simon says, no, I would like it the way it is. I said, sure, I'm with Neil. Walter has nothing to tell you. I just wanted to know what it feels like for whenever you go someplace for people to look at you. How do you just feel when everyone notices you? How do I feel? Yes. I ask for more money. <laughs> Your favorite president? Lincoln. <laughs> I voted for him twice. <laughs> I don't get mixed up in politics. I don't tell Ronnie Reagan or, or, or Bush how to run the country, and they don't tell me how to sing Red Rose Rag. Well, I got the right guy this time. You better have. <laughs> All right, get in here, Boynes. I've been trying to tell you I'm not George Bourne. My name is Ronald Reagan. Yeah, that's right. I've seen you in pictures. I just went over to Burns' house to plead with him not to sing at my dinner tomorrow night. Hey, what's your most favorite joke? Okay, I'll tell you my favorite joke. But it's not a joke, it's a true story. There was a great actor, his name was Wilton Lacai. It was like George, like uh, the Barrymores. And he did a Broadway show every summer. And in, uh, every, every winter. And the summer he'd play vaudeville. And he was playing Keats Theater in Cincinnati. And on the bill was a little act with him, Davis and Darnell, a little dancing act. And after rehearsal Monday morning, they went into the bar to get a drink. And there was uh, uh, Wilton Lakai. And they walked up to Mr. Lakai and said, Mr. Lakai, we can't tell you how excited we are to be on the same bill with you. He said, thank you, boys. And one boy said, uh, Davis said, we deem it an honor we could buy you a drink. And he said, no, he says, I'd rather drink alone. I just got a wire saying I lost my mother. And uh, Davis said, we know just the way you feel. Our trunk is missing. <laughs> you see, in Baldwin, your trunk came before your mother. <laughs> well, how do you think your life would have been different if you wouldn't have married Gracie? I'd still be working with a seal. <laughs> Before I met Gracie, I worked with a seal, I worked with a dog. I don't know. I, I was very, very fortunate, very lucky that I uh, met Gracie and that she married me. Mr. Burns, I know that uh, you and Jack Benny were good friends, and I was just wondering, uh, what was the funniest practical joke you ever played on him? Well, uh, Jack Benny was a great comedian, but offstage he was pathetic. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm having lunch with him once at the, at the uh, Brown Derby restaurant. 
And um, the waiter came up. I said, I'm going to have bacon and eggs. He says, I'm going to have cream of wheat. He said, I hate cream of wheat. I said, why do you want a cream of wheat? He says, Mary says it's good for me. I said, tell Mary to eat cream of wheat. <laughs> then the waiter came over and says, I'll have bacon and eggs. And Jack says, okay, I'll have bacon and eggs too. I said, when the check comes, give it to Jack Benny. <laughs> and Jack said, why should I take the check? I said, if you don't take the check, I'll tell Mary you had bacon and eggs. <laughs> I was at his house. I was about 100, 150 people at a big party. And um, Jack said to me, the party isn't moving. It's not working. I said, Jack, it's working fine. Everybody's talking. We're all drinking. He said, don't tell me. I'm in show business too. I know a party moves. This party isn't moving. I didn't know what to say to him. I said, why don't you go upstairs and take off your pants and come down in your shorts with Mary's hat on and play the violin? And I was kidding him. He says, you, you think that'll work? I said, of course. So he went upstairs and took off his pants, and I said to everybody at the party, look, Jack is coming down in his shorts with Mary's hat and playing the violin. Don't look at him. <laughs> and, and Jack came down and played the violin. Nobody looked at him. He fell on the floor, and he said to me, George, now the party is moving. <laughs> tonight. I know. You know. I had it done at the beauty parlor. Oh. And George, I heard the most wonderful joke over there. You want to hear it? Sure, we'd all love to hear it. Had everybody dying laughing. Well, let's, let's hear it. Well, one fella said to the other fella, if you don't think so, brother, you ought to see my wife. <laughs> is, uh, is this the whole joke? Oh, no, there was a lot of stuff ahead of it that I didn't hear, you see, but this is the line that had everybody dying laughing. <laughs> Uh, Gracie, I, I, I don't think you ought to tell that. Too risque. Too naughty. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's talk about your brother. All right, which one should we talk about? The one who's married or the one who's in love? The one who's in love. Willie, the tall one. The one that has the scar on the chin. Oh, the, uh, the appendicitis scar. <laughs> <laughs> now, appendicitis is on the stomach, you see. If, if yeah, I know, but Willie was ticklish down there, so they had to the operate. <laughs> Uh, how is Willie? Willie? Mm. Oh, Willie broke his back, you know. Oh, broke his back? Mm-hmm. On account of he's left-handed. <laughs> broke his back because he's left-handed? Mm-hmm. You see, he had a donut in his right-hand pocket, and when he tried to take it out with his left hand... Broke he... his back? Yeah. <laughs> well, the next time he's got a donut in his right-hand pocket, tell him to try to take it out with his right hand. Uh, it's hard to do when you got your pants on backwards. <laughs> Still play any golf? No. No? I'll tell you, I played, I used to play golf with Harpo Marx. Oh. And uh, we played, and I, when I played golf, if I played good, I used to sing. And that would annoy the fellows that I played with. <laughs> and when I played bad, I was miserable to play with. So I was lousy to play with. Anyway, we played golf. And Harpo was one on the par on the freight hole. And that's the best golf we ever played. Well, I didn't sing, I didn't smoke, I didn't would breathe. And then on the fourth hole, there's a long hole. And on the third shot, he was in the trap. And up on top of the hill. He went up there in the trap, he got into the sand trap. And he looked down, he said, why are you standing down there? I said, Harpo, you're one on the par, I don't want to annoy you. I'll stay down there. He said, no, come up there, you, you are annoying me. Stand where you always stand. So I got up and I stood there. Now he's playing, fiddling around with the club with the nine iron. He says, why aren't you looking at me? I says, Harpo, I don't want to disturb you. You're one on the par. He says, look at me, act like you always act. I said, okay. As he picked up his club, I started to sing. He missed the ball and we were friends. <laughs> Gracie had a style all that was unique to herself. We were wondering if uh, the voice that she used 
when she was in comedy, was that her own voice? That was her natural voice. And that's the I'll voice she used to Gracie, talk to you with. What made Gracie good and different? See, Gracie didn't think she was dumb. Uh, Gracie thought she was smart. When Gracie, when I started to work with Gracie, I'd walk out on the stage, I'd do nothing. I said to Gracie, how do you, how's your brother? She talked for 22 minutes. <laughs> By the time I found out I had no talent, I was too big a star to do something else. <laughs> Gracie, any, any news from home? Well, I, uh, I had a letter from my little niece, Jean. What did she say? She didn't say anything. She didn't phone. It was a letter. She wrote it. I mean, what did she write? Oh, well, it's spring again, and my family is uh, putting on a backyard circus like we used to do when I was a kid. Every spring, you kids used to put on your own circus? Yes. But, of course, the admission was free. But that's only for people who can afford it. Yeah, well, that, that's because we're living in a democracy. Yeah, isn't it nice? It certainly is. Well, anyway, my, uh, my cousin Barney uh, was the sword swallower. And, oh, what a performance he put on. He was, he was the sword swallower? Yes. And the kids would all cheer uh, when he put a sword that long down his throat. Could Barney really swallow a sword? Well, it was just a trick. You know the scabbard the sword fits in? Yeah. Well, uh, before the show, he uh, he stick that down his throat. <laughs> and then uh, when he slipped the sword into it, everybody thought Johnny he was, was swallowing it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a shame to fool the public like that. But admission was free. Oh, I forgot about it. <laughs> And then my Uncle Otis was the strong man. Uncle Otis? Uh, yes, he'd come out in a leopard skin and put big nails in his mouth and twist them between his teeth until they bend. That's quite a trick. Yeah, but he looked pretty ridiculous walking around with all those bent teeth. <laughs> well, they, 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 they'd come in handy if he happened to get a crooked ear of corn. Tell you something. Gracie wasn't dumb on the stage. Gracie thought that she was smart. Gracie never told a joke. She explained it to you. Anyway, one night, one night I was married to Gracie then about over oh, 15 or 20 years. And I got, I had too many martinis. And I fooled around with a girl. And I called up Jack Benny when I got home. I knew I made a mistake and I told Jack Benny the story. Oh, uh, before that, Gracie wanted a silver centerpiece for the table. Cost $750. I said, Gracie, we don't need any centerpieces. We got centerpieces. Anyway, then I fooled around with the girl. And then I told it to Jack Benny. And the upstairs maid came over to me the next day. She's Mr. Burns. And Mrs. Burns heard your phone conversation with Jack Benny. The next day, I brought home a silver centerpiece for $750. And a diamond brace, a diamond ring for ten thousand dollars. Seven years later, Gracie said to Mary Benny, "I wish George would cheat again. I need another son of this." I'd like to. I just saw Oh God One and Oh God Two this week, and I just wondered by playing God, even though it was a script. Did you feel any different? Did you feel any holier? Do you feel well, that your message you, you came across? Well, you try to believe the words. If the script is good, you're good. If you get a good script and a good director, and the words are good, you're good. You know, if you get a bad script, you know, you, and if you take it, you, you're no good. And I'm God, I don't know. You know what? I know when I die, I'm taking my music with me. <laughs> There's this vaudeville up there, I want to start all over again. Mr. Burns, do you have any plans for any upcoming movies in the near future? Well, they want me to, we're talking next week, they're coming over to the office. They want me to do Oh God 4. Well, I'll do it. I'll do it if it's a good script. See, the first script was a good script with John Denver. John Denver is a very nice man. If God really came down and wanted a nice man, he'd pick John Denver. Then the second script, oh God, was the little girl. I don't think God would come down for that little girl. I don't think God would come down for Henny Youngman or Milton Berle. And then the third one was God and the Devil. That was pretty good. 
And they're coming over uh, next week at my office. They're going to read the script for me. I want this to be different, to make it different, like God takes a holiday and comes down. <laughs> Something like that. Hi, Mr. Burns. Yeah, hello. I'm so glad the world has you. You're wonderful. You're a gift. Thank you. Are you, are you married? No, I'm not. Well, good. <laughs> I understand, I understand you like going out with younger women. At your age, what do you do with them? Well, from here up, I'm fine. <laughs> oh, no. Mr. Burns, who writes or has written all of those darling, funny little songs that you sing. Well, I'm going to sing them. I'm going to sing a few well, songs. Who wrote, who wrote them? Well, who knows? They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, me, let me tell you something. You're the only people I know that's alive. I wanted to know, we, my wife and I heard that you were booked for your 100th birthday. Where is it? <laughs> when I'm 100 years old, I'm playing the Palladium Theater in London. <laughs> Look, let me tell you something. I don't believe in dying. I died in Altoona. <laughs> I can't die again. Well, first of all, Mr. Burns, I'd like to say I'm a big fan of yours. And it was obvious that you and Gracie had a wonderful marriage. What advice could you give us here in the audience to have a, a happy marriage like you had? Marriage was a byproduct of what we did for a living. If the audience was good, I was a great lover. I never remember having um, kissing Gracie where she, she applauded me. It's, uh, you, don't, you don't work too hard at marriage. If you work, you sweat. You sweat, you know, you don't smoke. <laughs> I know you haven't married since Gracie passed away. Oh, Is there a reason? I, 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 I'd never get married. I had a very wonderful marriage. I was married to Gracie for 38 years. And, we had, and the nice thing about marriage is uh, I was not a great lover. Uh, marriage is not what you do in bed. Marriage is when you get out of bed. And, and I was, I was a very fortunate man. I had a wonderful wife. She was a great lady, great lady. If it wasn't for Gracie, I wouldn't be here. She made it all possible. <laughs> Gracie very much and um, you once stated that you had trouble falling asleep after she died. Um, can you tell us that story? Okay, I'll be glad to. Uh, well, I'll tell you a nice thing I did once. Uh, should I tell it to you? Okay. Gracie was very sick the last couple of years and we had a round the clock nurses. And I bought Gracie a sable coat for $12,000. I brought it home and gave it to her. And she said to the nurse, she says, I can't be that sick. He never would buy me a sable coat for $12,000 or all that sick. But she never wore it. She passed away. And when Gracie passed away, well, you know, well, what are you doing when you die? People die, you can't, they, you know. In Baltimore, when they canceled you, the manager gave you back your pictures and you were canceled. They knock on your door, and I was unhappy, I was crying. Hey, hey, you, you, how long can you cry? You cry and cry and cry until you stop. And then one night, we had twin beds the last couple of years. I went into Gracie, I slept in Gracie's bed. And that helped a lot. That's the story. Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns, I... Where are you? <laughs> Here I am. Mr. Burns, I know you're very agile and, and damsel in distress, and I know you've sang it at other occasions. Could you sing us a song today? Sure. What do you think? Yeah. 
How do you like that? I'm 93 and he can't walk. <laughs> let's do, uh, let's do, it's a cute song. These are all very old songs. The only way to go. Like most people everywhere, I've had my wear and tear. What much shock the Western world is I don't even care, but it's the only way to go. It's the only dream I know. I'm contented just to be uncomplicated me. So don't dig any deeper, what you get is what you see. I'm the only man you'll find who has nothing on his mind. So please play it in my key. And watch my dreams become real. Oh no, please don't go. I want to tell you how happy I feel. I'll be happy till I die, my lovely dreams and I. Relax until they take us to that stage up in the sky. It's the only way to go. It's the only way. It's the only way. It's the only way to go. Thank you, thank you. My, my kid brother, it's a good song, a very old song. My kid brother, he's a lazy kid. One day's work is all the work he did. He wrote a song entirely wrong, but up in Yonkers it is going strong. George M. Cohen and the other gang heard my brother when the song he sang. He said it cannot miss, it's bound to be it. How could it miss when the chorus goes like this? Oh, I woke up in the dawn, my love was gone. And there was I beneath the skies of gray. So my hat I gave a tilt, my cane I gave a twirl, went merrily, merrily, merrily on my way. Oh, I didn't have a cent, my rent I spent. I knew I'd have to leave the key of pay. So my hat I gave a tilt, my cane I gave a twirl, went merrily, merrily, merrily on my way. But in the lining of my pocket, I happened to find a lonesome little dime. I'll just have to toss it up, says I. Heads for coffee, tails for a shine. But it fell upon the ground, and there it found an open manhole where it went astray. So my hat I gave a tilt, my cane I gave it well, went merrily, merrily, merrily. Merrily, merrily, merrily on my way. Here's a song, you can all join in on the chorus. Play spark, seen dark. See if you know the chorus. Play spark, seen dark, great big moon is shining through the trees. Cast to me you, sounds of kisses floating through the breeze. Act one begun, dialogue is would you like the spoon? And it's my cue with you, underneath that great big moon. What's the chorus? Right, by the line. Everybody. By the silver moon, we can spoon. With my honey, I like love spoon. I don't. My honey, I love spoon. Honeymoon, honeymoon. Keep shining, Joan. Keep shining, Joan. Those silvery beams will bring our dreams. I'll be cuddling some. By the silver moon. By the silver rainbow. Want to hear some more? Should have sent them home. Oh. I don't know if I remember this, but I'll try. Red Rose Rag. Red Rose Rag. It's uh, rag time. Bum, 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 down in the garden where the red roses grow. Oh my, I want to go. Pluck me like a flower, cuddle me an hour. Love me, let me learn the red rose rag. Red leaves are falling in that flowery den. Bees come and I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll sing the chorus for you. Pick a pen, pick a pick a pen to fill. Oh, the hell with it. <laughs> what do we do, buddy? What about... Except the... The what? 
18 again? Okay, 18 again. At a bar down in Dallas, an old man chimed in, and I thought that he was out of his head. Just being a young man, I just laughed it off when I heard what that old man had said. He said, I'll never again turn the young ladies' heads or go running off into the wind. I'm three quarters home from the start to the end. I wish I was 18 again. I wish I was 18 again. And going where I've never been. But old folks and old oaks, standing tall, just pretend. I wish I was 18 again. Now time turns the pages, and no life goes so fast. The years turn the black hair all gray. I talk to some young folks. Hey, they don't understand the words this old man's got to say. I wish I was 18 again and going where I've never been. But old folks and old oaks standing tall just pretend. I wish I was 18 again. Lord, I wish I was 18 again. Better not walk off, you'll hurt yourself. Okay. Goodbye, Marty. Mr. Burns, the world loves your singing. Have you ever had professional singing lessons or it just came natural to no. you? No. I've never, no, no. Just, uh, I sang with, I'd always loved to sing. I, I, when I was born, I, the doctor kept slapping me, but I kept on singing. <laughs> Finally put me in an incubator and turned off the heat. <laughs> and I read in the paper once that Crusoe, I always, I always wanted to sing. That Crusoe ate a lot of garlic and that helped his singing voice. So I started eating garlic. And whenever I played hooky from school, I used to get a, a call from my teacher thanking my mother. <laughs> exactly what age did you start smoking cigars? <laughs> when I was 14. I smoked a seven cent recorder, it was a big recorder. And you had to wear a supporter, it was so heavy. <laughs> it took me, a, it took you practically three days to finish them. I thought it made me look like I was doing well. So I've been smoking, but I don't inhale. I never smoked a cigarette. See, I have nothing. It doesn't hurt me, but it hurts everybody in the room. <laughs> George, when you were down at the Lower East Side on Delancey Street, did you ever eat at Katz's restaurant? Sure. They, they, I ate at Wheatix, too. And I ate at Gitlis's. You got a bologna sandwich for two cents. Right. And the bologna, there was so much bologna in it, it used to hang out of the bread. I used to step on the bologna. First of all, I wanted to say thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. Um, of all your travels, where is the most fun place that you've ever been? Any place where there's a good audience. Great. It does, that, you know, and we, we travel all over. We, we, Gracie and I used to play London every year. We go there every year. We play five or six weeks. We loved it there. And we loved the Palace in New York. You know, the, those were big theaters to play in. And if there's a good audience and they like you and you, you like them, you, you're having a good time. And that's, I'm having a good time right now. There's a wonderful audience. Burns, when the uh, George Burns story comes out on film, who would you like to play your, your life? I'm playing myself. <laughs> Burns, has there been any single philosophy that has permitted you to have such a long, successful, and rewarding career? Yeah, I'll tell you. I think fall in love with what you're going to do for a living is terribly important. Terribly important to be 93 years old and get up in the morning and get out of bed and love what I'm going to do that day. 
That's terrible. I can't make any money in bed. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not through it. My sister Goldie made a fortune. Okay. <laughs> and I don't think anybody should retire. What do you do when you retire? You sit there and you play with your cuticles. <laughs> did, you, did you ever play with your cuticles? I tried it. It's not exciting. And I'm just tell you something. I would rather be a failure in something that I love to do than be successful in something that I hate. You see, I'm, I'm also an old philosopher. <laughs> Chris, you say good night. Good night. Good night.